What's up guys? How you all doing? Well, welcome to another video on our automated herb garden. What we're going to be looking at today is we're going to be looking at how to incorporate one of the weaved uh, smart plugs that we're going to be using the uh, Internet of Things device. If you haven't checked it out, check out some of my other videos on it. It's actually a pretty darn cool little device. I think I've got three or four videos talking about it. Uh, but we're going to integrate that along with the Intel Edison. I'm going to try not to cough too much during this because um, I've kind of been sick for uh, the little while of, all, of doing all this. So hopefully I won't cough. I'm going to be taking swigs of water, so excuse me. But we will get through this. This video will probably be kind of long because we're going to go through all the code and everything like we normally do. So sit back, relax, and grab yourself something to drink, and we're going to jump into it. All right, first thing is first. What we need to do is on the... Weave device, if you don't remember from the other videos, if you go to the user bin directory, there is scripts for turning the relay on and off inside the power plug. Okay, And like I said, those of you that don't know what I'm talking about, this power plug, go check out my videos. Um, just typed in Weaved, and you'll see a lot of stuff that I've done with Raspberry Pis and whatnot, and you should find those videos to see what I'm talking about and how this little thing works. So anyway... You can run these scripts, you can use the on-off scripts, and it'll turn the relay on and off just by running them. Well, that's fine and dandy on the on the weave, but we need to be able to run it from the Edison, okay? So, a quick and easy way of running a remote file or doing anything remotely is by SSHing. So, um, you can actually use SSH and say, use the username, so root, since that's the only one set up on the, on the uh, WRT device. Um, 192, one dot, I think it's 51. Yeah, it's 51. And then in quotes, you can type any terminal command. So any Linux command that you would type, it will SSH to the device you're wanting to SSH to, and it will run whatever you put in quotes over here, just like if you typed it in commands. So you could type user bin, whoops, bin, weaved IOT LED uh, on dot SH, end quote. Now, the only problem with this is when you do this, it'll prompt you for a password. It'll ask you for the root password of the uh, OpenWRT device or the weaved smart plug, okay? Well, that's not going to work because you can't be, you know, if we want to turn a light on remotely, because that's what this is going to be for, we're going to plug in our grow lights and turn them on and off uh, every eight hours since plants need about eight hours of light. So that's what we're going to do. Well, the problem is you want to do this automatically. You don't want to have to be going over there typing in a password every eight hours, right? So that's kind of a problem. Well, never fear. Using the SSL or secure sockets layer, you can generate RSA keys and give the key to the open WRT device. In this case, it's the weaved uh, power plug and basically say that key, if, if someone's coming across and wants to type a command, if they have the same key, then just let them through. You don't need a password. That's basically what RSA keys are for. So that's what we're going to do. Now, I have already done this, so I'm just going to be typing the commands in just for a reference so you guys can see the command and how you would type it in, but I'm not actually going to push enter. So first thing we need to do is go on the Edison and generate an RSA key uh, so that we can tell the weaved one about it so that way it knows that we're an authorized user. So to do this, you're going to type SSH dash key gen. Oh, and by the way, this works on any Linux platform that has open SSH installed. Okay, you can do this on in anything. I mean, this doesn't have to be just the Intel Edison and the uh, weaved. It could be Ubuntu to Fedora. It could be Ubuntu to Ubuntu. It could be the Raspberry Pi to Raspberry Pi. It could be anything that uses open SSH or uses the uh, open SSL, the secure sockets layer. You can do this with it should have these commands. So, okay, so we're going to do key gen, and you're just going to hit enter, and you're going to press enter at every single prompt. It's going to ask you, it's going to generate the RSA key pair, and it's going to ask you a few things. You're just going to hit enter to everything. Just enter, 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 okay? I'm going to control C out of that. Now, what this will do is if we CD, okay, right now, if I do a present working directory, I'm in home slash root, okay? If we CD to dot SSH in there, and we do a listing, 
it will create this id rsa.pub. I think it creates this id rsa as well. Creates these two files. Okay. The one we're interested in is this public uh, key. Okay. And even if we if we vi it uh, rs oops rsa.pub, there is the key. It's a great big long. Uh, alphanumeric plus special character everything it's a it's a big encrypted key is what it is it's an rsa key okay so what we need to do is once we've created that key we need to send that key over to this guy now on the open wrt side of the world so what we need to do is to get it over to this guy now is that we're going to have to append it to a file okay and, and so, as well as copy it over here. So the first thing we need to do is uh, SCP it over to this guy. So in order to do that, what we're going to do is we're going to do a SCP, okay? We're going to SCP the ID RSA.pub, okay? We're going to need to put it over on the OpenWRT's side of the world over in its .ssh folder, okay? So in order to do that, we're going to do root at 192 1.51 that's my uh, uh, one's IP address yours will probably be different then we're going to do a colon we're going to do a slash root slash dot ssh okay now that's all we're going to do and hit enter and what that will do now I've already done this like I said I'm just typing the commands if you look in root uh, dot ssh and do a listing it's it's there see I copied it I copied it previously but there it is it'll copy it over there and that's what you need Okay, so once you get it copied over there, then we have to append the key to the correct uh, known, or uh, not known, but authorized keys file, okay, over here on the OpenWRT. So to do that, we'll do it from the Edison. This command is coming from the Edison, okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to SSH, we're going to do our SSH command. Now, when you did that SCP, you'll have to type in your password, okay, because we haven't got the keys set up yet, okay. So every time we SSH or do an SCP, which SCP is secure copy, it uses the secure sockets layer to go over and copy things across. So it will ask you for your password. Once we get all finished with this, you should be able to do all that and not be prompted for a password, okay. So we're going to SSH again to our root at 192 and 1.51, okay? But this time, we're gonna echo a command, that's what the dollar open parentheses is, a command. We're gonna cat from the home directory dot ssh slash id rsa dot pub. What that's going to do is that's going to cat from the Intel Edison's ID RSA pub file. It's going to cat it, which uh, catting, if you don't know what that is, it just basically uh, echoes and, or spits out whatever is inside this file. So it's basically that key, that big long string we looked at earlier. That's what is this command, echo, cat, whatever, that's what that's going to return. Then what we're going to do is we're going to take that and redirect it, but we're just going to, we're going to do two greater thans, which means append. We're not going to do just one. One would completely wipe out the file that I'm going to put it in and write only this in there. Well, we don't want to do that because there could be other keys and stuff in there. We're going to just append it. So two greater thans means append. We're going to append it to Etsy, uh, drop bear. And it's going to go to the authorize. Whoops, I didn't click on it. Authorize. Uh, whoops, authorized keys is where it's going to go. Now, if we look over here, uh, normally you would put it in the .ssh folder. Well, in the OpenWRT, it uses drop bear, which is another kind of SSHing SSL. RSA thing. And so where that's located is in where I just said Etsy and then drop bear is where it's at. And you see there is an authorized keys uh, file that's in there. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to append it to that authorized keys file, but then we need to give this authorized key file a uh, read and write uh, capability so that uh, it can be used. So we're going to put a semicolon so we can type another command in here and we're going to say change mode 600 on Etsy drop bear authorized keys okay and then end quote that what this will do like I said is it will append the contents of this idrsa.pub 
to this authorized keys file. And if we go over here, because I've already done this, like I said, I won't be hitting enter on the command. But if I if I look at that, if I VI the authorized keys, if you look at, there's that key. So it's in there. So that's really all you have to do. Generate the key, copy the key file over, and then append it to that folder. Now, if I go over and I do my SSH command and make sure I type it right, I'm going to go to user bin do my listing. If I type slash user bin slash weaved IOT and I say relay on.sh, okay, and I hit enter, it should not ask me for a password. It should just return. And there it goes, and I just heard the relay click. Similarly, if I want to turn it off, change it to the off script and run it. And it just turned it off. So there you go. So now I don't have to have a password every time. So that's the first setup that we need to do. Now, to get date and time, that's going to be the next one. To get the date and time and be able to work on that properly, we're going to need to set up our current time zone. Now, for me, I live in Central America. So mine's going to be Central Daylight Time because we're on Daylight Savings Time right now. So what I'm going to do is I have to set up the time. We're going to use the command time date ctl or control now since i've already set mine up if you look at it um, it shows that it's central daylight time shows you the current date and the time and all that jazz and everything's now normally when you put this in it'll only have the utc or the universal time is the only one that it'll have in there so we have to we have to set our time zone now i'll go ahead and con add a link uh, to the thread that was about this so that you can see what other time zone commands have in. i'm just going to do my time zone so what we're going to do is we're going to do time, uh, time, date, CTL, and then you're going to set uh, set time zone. Okay, you're going to say America, at least for me is America, and then the closest city that is one of the, one in the list is Chicago, that is Central Time, and then four. And well, I think, and then that's that's it. Hit go. Of course, I probably spelled it wrong. Okay. Okay, I may have to look up the listing. Well, this is probably a good thing, because then I can look up the listing. So, you should be able to go to, if we do an ls-l on user share zone info America... We should be able to get here. You know what? I'm going to spread this out now that it's that way. It doesn't look all squished. Here, let's do it this way. There it is. Okay. So there we go. So here's all the different places. Chicago's one of them. Oh, I probably wasn't capitalizing the C. That's the problem. Let's get my deal. I probably need to capitalize the C since Linux is picky. That's what it was. Okay, so make sure you do your capitals. Okay, but anyway, I'm glad that it did that because that way I can show you. Here's all the acceptable ones for all the different Pacific and uh, whatever it is, you know, Central and probably Denver is probably for Mountain Time and all that stuff. So that's how you can list it out and show you um, where the different time zones are. But that's how you do that. So set time zone. And then when you use the date command, now you'll have the right Central Daylight Time. You'll have the right stuff. Okay, so that one's pretty easy. Like I said, I'll include a link in the description uh, to the thread that talks about that. And it has this command and everything else in it. Anyway, so now we've got everything pretty well set up on the Intel Edison. Now we need to write some custom software to control it all. I went with uh, using uh, C to do this. I wrote it, I called it light.c. And I'm going to open this up in programmer's notepad so we can get some color coding going on. And this is what we're going to do. So what we're going to do is we need to include the stdio, stdlib, and string.h. Okay. We're going to start our main function. We're going to declare some variables. We're going to declare the relay. We're going to use a relay variable to keep track of whether the relay is on or off. We're going to initially set it to on. Okay. The interval is the variable that we're going to use for how long it needs to stay on. I put eight. That's going to be in hours. So it's going to be eight hours is how long we want things to stay on and how long we want things to stay off. And then we're going to run the system command to uh, turn the relay on. Now system, 
will allow you to run any Linux terminal command. So what we're doing is we're doing the SSH. We're basically doing that command that we did. We're SSHing and then we're turning the relay on uh, remotely from the Edison. Okay, the software runs on the Edison. Okay, once we do that, now we need to get the date. Well, the problem with the date and time is that if you type date, it spits out this whole thing. We just want this piece and really more specifically, we just want the hour. Okay, so that's what this next command is doing is we are going to say date, which is going to give us that whole line. And then we're going to pipe it to awk, which awk is a, a, like a parsing tool. And what we're going to do is saying print four, we're getting the fourth item. Okay, we're getting the fourth item. One, two, three, four. So it's going to print all of that is what it's going to do. Well, then we're going to take that and hand it to another awk expression. If we look down here, awk dash F. What we're going to do is say we're going to use the colon as a delimiter. Okay, and say this is delimited by colons and we're going to print the first piece. Okay, so it, it numbers these as one. There's the colons and delimiter. This is the second piece, colon, and then the third piece is what it's going to do. So if I say print one, it's going to print this first piece, which is the hour. So we're going to basically get just the hour. We'll come back if we use this command. Now, what we're doing is we're redirecting it to a file because the system command will not actually return the output of this. The system command, if we were to set a variable equal to this, will output either a zero or a number greater than zero, signifying whether it was good or it was a bad command, whether it was successful or if it failed. Okay. So in order to read it back in to our C program here, we're going to output it to a file and then read that file. Okay, so I'm calling it initial.data for the initial hour. Okay, so we're going to grab the initial hour and throw it in that. So now we're going to come down through here and open a file where we're going to open that up. We're going to open it for read. Uh, of course, if we can't, we'll issue that we can't open it. And then we're going to do an F scan after we're going to read that into the variable initial hour is what we're going to do. Okay, then close the file. Now we're going to go down into our while loop. Now this is our permanent while loop that we're going to be running because this runs in the background. Okay, and it just runs over and over and over. And we're going to do the same thing. We're going to grab the date and time again, but we're going to output that one to current.dat because that's going to be our current hour. That's This is what we're going to be checking against the other one. Okay, so when we come back in here, we're going to say, all right, we open a shot. So we're going to come down in here. We're going to say, all right, what's the current hour? Okay, and we're going to go down through here and we're going to say, all right, now we're okay. If we can't open the file, we can't. We're going to load this into current hour. Okay. Okay. So we're going to um, come on down here after we've opened that, read that into current hour. We're going to go down here into the initial hour or into the, into the big if statement. So we're going to check to see if the current hour is greater than the initial hour. What we have to do with this now, it's always going to report in 24 hour clock. So you have to check to see if it has rolled over to the next day because we could have started this, let's say, uh, for whatever reason, at 10 o'clock at night. Well, that's 2,200 hours. Well, we'd go a couple of hours and the, there would only be a couple of hours where it would be greater and then it would roll over to zero and start over again. And so the current hour may actually be, in fact, less than the initial hour due to it rolling over to the next day. So that's what you have to check for and you have two different cases to handle and that's what we're going to look at. So in the case that it's greater than and let's say we started it at midnight, so zero hundred hours, and it goes for eight hours, so it goes till eight o'clock in the morning. Well, then current hour would be eight o'clock in the morning, and the initial hour would be zero, so it would be greater. Okay, so if it is, then we're going to check to see um, if it's greater than our interval, which is eight. So we're going to take the current hour, we're going to subtract the initial hour from it, and see if what's if you know the time that has elapsed has been eight hours or not. If it has been eight hours, then we're going to look to see if the relay is equal to a one. And if it's basically, is it on? If it's on, we're going to turn it off, reset relay, reset the current or the initial hour. And then we're going to go on. We'll just pass on through and go loop back around. Otherwise, if the relay is, is uh, off, then we'll turn it on because it could be the dark cycle. So it will turn on and then reset the current hour and reset the relay uh, status variable to a one. Okay, so then we're going to go else. Now, here's the tricky one. If we have rolled over, we have to calculate. We, we don't want to miss the hours that it took before we rolled over. Okay, so how we do that is if the current hour is less than the initial hour. So let's say it's in that case. We're at 
the current hour is six o'clock in the morning, but yet our initial was at 10 o'clock the other night, which would be 2,200 hours, you know, the day before. So you have two hours to get you to 24, you know, which then it rolls to the next day. So there's two hours there. And then you've got the six. So it has been eight hours. But uh, so to calculate for that, you're going to take there's 24 hours in a day. We're going to subtract the initial hour from from that. So you have whatever remaining hours were left in the day. Okay, and we're going to take those remaining hours that were left and add them to the current hour because the current hour is now based on the next day. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. That's really confusing to talk about. I, I, I really should probably draw this out. But in any case, that's what we're doing right here. Then we're checking to see if that whatever this calculation is, once we calculate the uh, time accumulated, is that greater than or equal to our eight hour interval. Okay. And then same thing goes. If it is, then we're going to turn it on. And if it is, and then we, uh, it's the relay's on, we're going to turn it off. The relay's off, we're going to turn it on. Okay. And then we're going to sleep five seconds. And so that way we wait five seconds before checking all the times. So that's basically how it runs. Hope that wasn't real confusing, but that's basically uh, how this little timing thing is going to operate. And like I said, I'll have this code and other codes all posted on my project code link. So uh, go there to check it out and download it. The Arduino code. Oh, that's the next thing I forgot before I mess up the Arduino code. If you remember from the last video and you need to watch the last video because I go through the Arduino code. Remember, there was that uh, section that I said was commented out. You'll uncomment that section and you'll run the system home root light ampersand. And what that will do is that will run it. You'll take and, oh, I guess we need to compile it first. I'll show you how to do that here in just a second. When you compile it, I named my executable light is what I named mine. You can name yours whatever you want, just as long as you uh, put the name in uh, this system command so it can run it. Okay, you will uncomment this and then what will happen is when the Arduino starts up, it will run this command and it will start that uh that C file running is what it will do. And so it'll start that program running in the background. So it'll constantly start checking the time. So you want to uncomment that there. Then we need to compile this. So we're going to come over to our Intel Edison. Okay. And like I said, I put mine in just the root folder. Okay. Light.c. And to compile this, those of you that don't know GCC compiler or whatever, you're going to run the command GCC dash o for output file and then this is where you'll name the executable whatever you want i named mine light okay and then you give it the source file which is light.c okay and hit enter and it shouldn't give you any errors everything should go okay um, and it just gives you the return prompt and then it will create uh, this guy you don't have to worry about creating these two files they will be created automatically when it uh, does the redirection so when it does this command here does this part, it'll actually create that file if it doesn't exist. If it does exist, it will delete the contents of it and add whatever this is to the contents is how that works. So once you do that, then you can you can run it. I can do a dot slash light. Now, if I do this, it will just lock my terminal because it will run it uh, and it won't do a... Uh, it won't do the... the Control C won't break out of it because it's in an infinite loop. The only way to get out of this is that you'll have to SSH. In fact, I can probably SSH from here uh, or not. Um, is that you have to SSH uh, to the Intel Edison, which I'll just grab me another putty display here real quick. Log in. And what you'll have to do is you have to do a PS function. Pipe it to grep and grep for light, okay? And there it is, see it running? What we wanna do is we wanna kill that process. So you're gonna say kill, 2731 is the process ID, and hit enter. And see, see it stop over here? So that's what will stop it from running. Same thing goes if when you run it with the Arduino or run it with the Intel Edison when it starts up in the Arduino code, it will run it in the background. So what it will do is it'll do this, and do it with an ampersand, which will give it a process ID and run it in the background, okay? So the program can continue working, okay? But it is still there. If we run the PS command, see, it's still running, but we still have our terminal back. So same thing. If you need to stop it for whatever reason, you're going to do a kill 2798. You know, you'll have to run this PS command to figure out what the process ID is that it gave it, okay? And then you're going to hit enter. 
Now, it does tell you what the process ID is when you start it, but if you start it from the Arduino, you, you won't have that process ID number. So you'll come in here, do the PS, and then if we do the PS and grep for it, it is killed out and it's, it's finished. So that's how you do it. Now, you could go above and beyond and add some coding or whatever around that. I'm just doing the basic skeleton. You guys could write some software and stuff to where when you power down the Edison or shut down the Edison, it will gracefully go SSH over here and shut it down gracefully and all that jazz. But mine was just, it's just a rough skeleton of, of how this is going to work. So that's basically all you have to do um, with your... Intel Edison to get it to work with the weaved deal. And it doesn't have to be the weave thing. You could actually actually set this whole setup with uh, with like a Raspberry Pi or something and hang a relay off of it or, or another Intel Edison and hang a relay off of it, um, off of the GPIO or something and connect that relay to a to a uh, receptacle of some sort. You know, I just had the weaved uh, smart plug laying around and it was a nice all-in-one little device. So I figured we'd set it up. But you could do this with really anything. As long as they're two Linux platforms, you could you could do it with either one. It's not a problem. So guys, that pretty much is it. I know this video was long, but uh, I appreciate you sitting here all the way through the video. Um, I will upload this code to the project code link for you guys to download and play with at your leisure. Um, as well as the Arduino codes up there. Of course, you know that from if you've seen the last video, I posted it to the last video. But uh, the Arduino codes up there and everything. So I'll put some links in the description about how to set up time zone, and create RSA keys and all that. As well as, you know, any other questions you guys had. I know I went through this fairly quick for, I know how long it took, but I did go through it fairly fast. So any questions you have, please feel free to ask. Put it in the comments down below. Um, any other ideas or anything you have, uh, listen in the comments. Also, check me out on Instructables. I'm going to take this whole uh, automated garden thing, put all the videos together into one giant Instructable, and put that on Instructables.com. Um, I am there. You can follow me. I have an account there. So you can check that. In fact, I've been doing that with any uh, large project that I do. I usually put together and make an Instructable and put it over on Instructables. I also make a playlist. So if you check through my playlist, you'll see a playlist that will have all the videos in it as well. So that way you aren't trying to hunt and peck for the videos uh, around my channel because I release them at uh, different times and there could be other videos in between. So if you want it all together, check out Instructables and check out my playlist. So you can find me on Twitter. Uh, when I'm doing big projects like this, I like to try to take pictures of the progress and upload it on Twitter because it's a lot faster and a lot easier to tell you guys what I'm doing without having to create a whole video and edit it and everything else. So check Twitter, um, subscribe to that. I try to do it to Google+, Plus, but I don't always hit Google+, Plus um, as much as I'd like to. But check all that out. Um, subscribe to that so that way you'll be in the know. Um, we got t-shirts for sale. Check out the uh, zazzle.com slash misperry. Check out the t-shirts. I've got some up there. I've got to upload some more. So you can check me out there as well. So I'm pretty much uh, on most of the social media sites so you can find me. And as well as Hackaday, I try to put myself at Hackaday uh, IO or whatever that is, io.hackaday.com slash uh, misperry or something like that, or .hackaday.io slash misperry, I can't remember. I think there's a link in the description. Anyway, check me out there if you have an account there and all that jazz. So guys, I've done enough rambling for one day, so hope you enjoyed it. Keep coding, keep building, because that's what it's all about is the fun of electronics, guys. Take care and we'll see you next time. 